What's up, fam? Mr. Bro Capitalist coming at you on this happy Thomas Soul Friday. And I'm back again doing these reactions to reactions because I love seeing people absorbing knowledge. And one thing I always say about logic is sexy, it's irrefutable, it's undeniable. And so what can the left do, meaning the I'm when I say left, I ain't talking about JFK left. I'm talking about these new progressive woke Marxists, right? What can they do to keep people like you, my man here, and myself from absorbing absorbing this logic, considering it, and possibly getting out of their woke cult? They stop you from hearing it. Period. The algorithms help help with that. Uh, the language police help with that. Everything's racist. Everything is triggering. Words are violence. All that has the the intent is to protect black folks and their feelings, or whatever. Uh, but the effect is it's like an apartheid on knowledge. So I don't know my man, Mr. Video, but I saw that he was checking out a Thomas Soul video. And I want to just comment on his reactions and maybe spread some of my knowledge on the subject along the way. But I really want you guys to stick around to the end. Normally, I don't ask this, but stick around to the end because I'm going to do another magic trick. I'm going to put together how reparations can lead to the rescue of the American banking system on the backs of blacks. All right, here we go. Hope that made sense. Here we go, here we go. Hearing of any of these two guys, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I was supposed to know these guys or what. So it's my first introduction to Thomas Sowell and Trevor Noah. <laughs> Interesting topic to first learn, you know, about these guys on. Thomas Sowell looks, oh no, this is, no, Thomas Sowell is the black, the black guy. Trevor Noah looks rather young. <laughs> He's arguing with uh, <clears throat> Thomas yeah, Sowell. He looks black. more older and experienced. Trevor, what you got to say? Is this valid? <laughs> you know what I mean? Follow me on everything in the description, y'all. Follow. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the channel. If you haven't. Subscribe to this one, in the description as well. It's the links. All right, bro. Let's get in. Let's get to it. Let's get into this, y'all. Let's see what's going on, man. Let's see what's let's see what's being said. Let's see what I'll learn. Let's go. Come on. You feel me? Thomas Sal versus Trevor Noah. So, but what you got? Let's so go. to your question, to your question, I think you have to understand what the word reparations means first. So reparations, you are repairing something that you have broken. You are paying for something that you were supposed to pay for. I'm not saying that there aren't people living in America today who are suffering and are going through pain and strife because of what's happening when it comes to, um, you know, uh, machines taking jobs, uh, factories becoming industrialized, etc. But reparations is a specific conversation about a specific time in America. And that is black. Come on, bro. Puff, puff, give. Come on people were slaves. Article that got a lot of attention in the Atlantic a couple of years ago called The Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Quote, white supremacy is a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. Reparations is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely. Close quote. And Tom Sowell, who actually saw Jim Crow with his own eyes and experienced it, Responds how? It would be nice to know his uh, evidence for what he said, just to be old fashioned about it. Uh, no, it, 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 it was a rotten system. But I don't know how, how, how we get from that to reparations. I mean, what we see in the United States in terms of the bad things, you see all around the world. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors, had been slaves. I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Slavery was not confined to one set of races. I suspect that most of the people who were either slaves or slave owners around the world were neither white nor black. 
I mean, this was this was a universal curse of the human species. Africa, the Middle East, Asia, all of uh, and, and the universe cursed with the human species. That he could have ended it right there. And he he could have stopped it. Right there. He's right. He could have ended it right there because just that will get you to think. Well, wait a minute. He said most people who were slaves were not black nor white, and those non-black and white people aren't even in this discussion. Like, what's going on? Okay, let's go. Right there. Thomas is kind of speaking some sort of truth. Ah, oh, man, these type of videos are crazy because everybody be like, oh, you're Uncle Tom, you're this and that. But you got to think of what this man's saying. Slavery really started with the Indians, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, but yeah, he's right. You know, the first thing once, if you start to refute the narrative that's out there that's been perpetrated by the powers that be, so to speak, first thing, if you're black, you're Uncle Tom, and if you're white, you're a racist. So just hold on to that. And we're going to skip ahead here. Slavery, look at the numbers, look at the time, look at the level of work. You could not work toward your freedom. For most black people in America, this was a time when you were, that was it, you lived and died as a slave. And so that's what reparations is about. The other thing, I have a slight um, sidebar there on the history of slavery. Mm -hmm. The history of slavery, slavery existed all over the world for thousands of years among all sorts of people, as far back as the history of the human species goes. All right, so I, we're beating a dead horse with that. So let's skip ahead a little bit more. Uh, I think I think I had it at around here. White privilege, activate. That's crazy. Your skin, if you cannot see the benefits that you have. The book that I'm writing now, I, I discovered this is true not only in the United States. Uh, it's true in England. And the, and the situation is wholly different. And yet, if you read uh, the, the data, for example, from, from uh, London, the, the, the uh, educational tests and so forth, you see that uh, there, uh, immigrants from Africa pass this test they have. Uh, I'm talking about low-income people now. Uh, six, nearly 60% of the time. Uh, uh, blacks from uh, Caribbean, like 50%, so on. Native-born whites in the same low-income bracket pass this test 30% of the time. Uh, and it's the same thing. The, the foreign people come in, they haven't had generations of being steeped in the welfare state vision, the vision of grievances, victimology, and resentments, the idea that there are enemies out there dedicated to keeping you down. That's the, that, that's the message that's been pumped into the head of the of the white lower class in Britain. And that's the uh, the image that's been pumped into the black low income people in the United States. And the and the results are the same in both cases. But the thing I, try I was to just trying to get that. I was just trying think to think of that. it more like golf. Don't think of it as privilege then think of it like a handicap. Right? In golf they acknowledge that you are in a position where you need so many advantages to be competitive in the game. Is that is that so how do you get to reparations like if you if logically speaking if everybody in the world can trace ancestors back to a slave owner literally because slavery was just part of life like war like illness marriage like it's just an institution right so if you can trace that back to everybody how does slavery become a part of the reparations for african-american argument you have to attach that to something well we'll attach it to let's say because due to slavery, uh, little Johnny over there can't read and write. The systematic racism or whatever that's connected to slavery. Slavery ended in 1865. A generation after that, all of those illiterate, newly emancipated, one generation later, half of them could read and write. They were on their grind, right? 85% of children were born to two parent households, right? So I'm just being real brief here, it's somewhat illogical to connect reparations directly to me, 
right? So there's a middleman called the Jim Crow, which you can direct. You can, I can go, my grandmother's still alive and experienced that. But we kind of skip over that a bit. Now, San Francisco, they're trying to address that. But if you trace Jim Crow laws and their negative effects on Black people to the source, you're going to find at the end of that rainbow a bunch of Democrats. And the irony is it's a bunch of Democrats who are trying to push through reparations. This just don't make any sense, but we'll keep going. We'll keep going. We ought not to be doing this. You know, there are, there are various uh, laws and policies that benefit one group at the expense of another. But I think uh, affirmative action has the distinction of being one that it harms everybody, though in different ways. And so you, 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 there, there's, there's a lot of evidence that there are black kids who have all the qualifications to be successes in college, who nevertheless are failures because they are systematically mismatched with institutions whose standards they don't meet, even though they may meet the standards of 80 or 90 percent of the colleges in America. I remember I first aware of this when I was teaching at Cornell, and I found that half the black students at Cornell were on some kind of academic probation. Again, puff, puff, give, bro. I'm down. I'm down. And so I went over to the administration building and looked up the SATs of these students. The average black student at Cornell at that time scored at the 75th percentile. Which that's, is pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah that's not bad. That means that in, that in most colleges in this country, they would have no trouble, and many of them would be on the dean's list. But at Cornell, the average uh, liberal arts student at that time was in the 99th percentile. And and when you when you and when you're teaching the students, students like that, uh, you teach at a pace that most people of any race cannot keep up with. And I I was it was always complained that I was assigning all kinds of uh, reading. But heck, you know, I'm teaching kids who are in the top one percent. They can they they can keep up with it with the reading that I'm assigning. Top one, uh, so the top one percent, y'all. Damn, <laughs> must be good. You teaching smart mother jammers, man. Goddamn, what percent do I lie in? And he just brings up a a, a particular question that maybe. Not a, well, he brought up a question, but he's doing a little self-reflecting, right, that we all should do from time to time. And this is an opportunity for me to bring up one of my favorite analogies that I'm going to just keep pounding and pounding and pounding until I see it on national news. Now, look, let's take LeBron James because we all know who he is. I'm going to ask you a question about LeBron James. Assume that LeBron James never played an organized game of basketball until he was a senior in high school. Would you know his name? I'm going to go out on a limb and say probably not. There's a lot of it's guys out there that are 6'9", 6'8", right? What are the chances of him not picking up a basketball? In today's, in today's America, slim to none. But my point is, before he turned 18, how much work did he put into the game of basketball? After he, you know, elementary school, somebody threw a ball at him, he started bouncing, he never stopped, he's still bouncing that ball. So when it became time for him to consider college, he was his not God-given talents, if you want to equate it to genius, right? His God-given talents said, told people that he don't even need to go to college. He going to the NBA anyway. Just skip that. He's good enough now to play with grown men, right? He wouldn't have been good enough if he didn't put all that work in, right? He just would have been a tall guy, and maybe he would have had an interest in computer science, and you never know who he was, right? Now, let's take uh, another James. Uh, Mr. James James, right? Had no interest in basketball. Grew up down the street from LeBron. He was just into math. And after school, he went to math camp. He put all his effort into math. Now, what kid is going to do that? Not too many. 
So what do you, what do you have? You what does that kid need? The support of parents and the standards of parents and the demand of parents. Hey, get in there, study. Don't come out until you know this stuff backwards and forwards. Nothing less than the A is acceptable. This isn't unreasonable. You know why? All of Asia does it. I lived in Japan. Taught these kids, man. These kids, they, they ain't see the light of day, man. Everybody was on 24-7 lockdown from junior high to high school. Right? You go to school, then you go to Juku, which is an after-school program for school. Then you go home, you study, you eat, you take a bath, get up, do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Right? In America, you got immigrants, the Indians, the Chinese, same thing. They keep those values and beliefs, install them, instill them in their kids, and you know, don't come out of that room until you know the stuff backwards and forwards. They go into school and they compete on what's called an LSAT. I'm not an LSAT. Uh, SAT. And they knocking it out of the park so much so that they're trying to suppress them, right? Well, they're competing against people who look like me, whose parents are okay. Now, I ain't, this isn't a moral judgment. Most black parents are okay with allowing their children to go out and play and, and, and do more physical activity than academic activity. And when those children become adults and they start self-reflecting, hey, I wonder where I'm at. You are at wherever you're at relative to somebody else. So how smart are you? Well, it depends on who, you, who you're who you competing against. You know what I mean? So it's too late when you're 25 to be like, hey, man, I need to get on this math. No, if you want to be a professional, in the, like LeBron James, professional, in the world of math or, let's say, computer science, you can't start that dream at 25 or even 18. You got to start that when you are a baby. And hopefully you got parents or, or friends who will encourage you like the parents and friends of LeBron James who encouraged him. All right, let's keep it moving. What percent do I lie in? I'm, oh, I'm a decent reader, Thomas. Oh, my goodness. Percent? Now, I just thought about what I said relative to what he's saying. I'm not trying to disparage my man or talk crap about him or anything like that. I'm just making a general statement. Now, at the end of this, he's going to talk about he wants to uh, do something more, uh, blah, blah, blah. And the way to do that, I'm going to skip ahead here because I want to get into this reparations thing. The way to do that is to first and foremost, get off this, I'm a victim, I'm hopeless train. You can't do nothing if you're a victim. Nothing. The first thing you have to do as a victim to achieve anything is stop being a victim. So that's your first and foremost. If you're walking around with a gender studies major or degree in women's studies or a degree in African-American studies and you're finding out that the market it doesn't value that as much as a computer science degree, don't blame the white man because you got student loan debt and a basically useless degree, a valueless or un unvalued degree. <laughs> Stop. Take another route. Okay, I'm still young. Maybe I can get a degree in computer science, or maybe I can become an electrician, or maybe I become a plumber because the AI is taking over all the work. So I'm going to get a job where I can use my hands. AI won't take that over for a while, blah, blah, blah. But first and foremost, you got to stop being that victim. All right, peace. Not peace, but let's keep going. <laughs> They can they they can keep up with it with the reading that I'm assigning. Uh, so Cornell was taking very talented black kids and spending four years teaching them to feel inadequate. Yes, Suc and succeeding at that. Mm -hmm. Right. So what they say is you what? have a handicap of 15. So that means like you're going to be hitting from this T and you get more chances to get the ball in because we understand the position you're in. And if you're a black person in America from slavery from day one. <laughs> So in order to get to, and we're going to say peace to Mr. Video, thanks, bruh. Keep checking out his videos. Um, Mr. Video, keep checking out Time and Soul. And we're going to go over to our favorite city, San Francisco. Um, how do you sell something to people that's so illogical? Now, I just mentioned how illogical it is to directly equate 
slavery that ended in 1865, where blood and treasury, treasure was spilled to free uh, the people that were in bondage back then, right? I did a video, my last video was Immigrants Without Agency. Check that out, I spent some time on that. Um, how do you get to this being an, a major story? Reparations for people who identify as black in San Francisco in 2023. And the payout they're talking about is $5 million. There's like 111 recommendations. One being a $5 million lump sum payout. Another one is like $97,000 for 250 years. Uh, selling house, selling house to each black person, selling a house to each black person for a dollar. Ridiculous. So I often say the intentions of the left always sound great. We care so much about the blacks. They have a handicap, just like in golf. How are they supposed to do anything if they're black, right? So the intentions sound great. The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And the people paving that road, I consider them evil. So that's just me. That's just me. Because I don't believe these people are just dumb. <laughs> right? Somebody in that group knows what happens. Just like somebody knew about affirmative action. When you had a lot of people, a lot of black folks in the 50s who, when that affirmative action got pushed through, a lot of black folks didn't want it. We don't hear nothing about that. Right, because what happened? What Thomas So is telling you, the effect of uh, affirmative action is to is people were warning about that before it passed, but it passed because of the good intentions, right? So here, the good intentions are: we're going to make everybody whole. We're going to hold hands, sing kumbaya. But first, before we hold hands, we're going to kneel before the black people uh, because all white people are racist. All this stuff is just illogical, man but it's being pushed and sold, right? And if you're wondering, how do you qualify <laughs> for this money? Um, hurry up, run to San Francisco. No, you can't do that. Uh, you had to have lived in San Francisco for 13 years, but there's two qualifications, You, you more than two, but uh, you have to be an individual who identifies as Black, African-American on public documents for the past 10 years, right? and you're 18 years older. So if you're 17, I don't know, I guess you don't get it. Uh, maybe on your 18th birthday, you get it. If you're 15, maybe when you turn 18, you know, you get it. Or maybe your parents get it for you. I don't know. Um, th those two plus two of these eight. So one of them is like, if you've been incarcerated due to the war on drugs, um, enlisted or the direct descendant of a certificate of pre preference holder or whatever. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is ludicrous. It's ridiculous. Now, how is this going to help race relations in America? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Can you imagine the day after this happens <laughs> and you get... You got brothers in San Francisco, including the bums, walking around with $5 million with somebody getting robbed. But anyway, there's going to be a lot of animosity, man. It's going to be, you know, you realize how hard it is to exist in San Francisco, one of the most expensive places in the world to exist. People need like three jobs just to make rent, and you're just giving out $5 million. Well, that's going to help. But let's say it don't. Let's say it's not five million. They crazy. Let's say it's two million. All right, say it's two million. It's two million dollars, right? So, or free house, or ninety-seven thousand dollars for the next two hundred fifty years. It's ridiculous. It will not help anybody. The non-blacks and the blacks. Why? Because you dump all that money into an economy. What happens? It's hyperinflation. Everybody's apples cost twelve hundred dollars. So it ain't helping nobody. It screws everybody. Black folks, you have a target on your back. White folks, now your apples cost $12 along with the uh, the black folks. It ain't helping nobody. Guess who it does help? The banks. So you get your $5 million check. Where are you going to put it? 
Well, you're going to go to the bank. You're going to cash it out. You're going to pull up with your van and, and request $5 million in hundreds. They don't have that. So you got to park that in the bank account. And if you know anything about fractional reserve, the fractional reserve banking system, right? Banks, whatever you put in that bank, if you put a dollar in the bank, the bank can lend out 10 on it. If you put $100 in the bank, the bank can lend out 1000 and collect interest on that. So if, I, if I'm a San Francisco resident who identifies as black, lived there 13 years, and was incarcerated for selling drugs or whatever, and get my money, I'm going to take it to Wells Fargo, Chase, whatever, put, park it there, they get to loan, loan out like $50 million and collect interest on that. Meanwhile, they'll live, the people, the executives at Chase, they ain't living next to no black people or poor white people. They just getting paid off the backs of blacks. All this stuff is, once again, is a Trojan horse, and inside of it is a bunch of socialist Marxist agendas. And they're using the plight, the perceived plight of Black people to push this stuff through. I'm getting sick and tired of it. We have to stop this. One way to stop this is just to hear logical arguments. So when you get these pink hair, blue people uh, running around screaming and won't let logic be heard, question that. Because I like my man who you got the do-rag on the cap, smoking a blunt. All he had to do was hear it. And he took a step back. Wait a minute. Yeah, that makes sense. Why are they pushing this hopelessness on us? Why are they pushing this victimization on us? Why do we have to be dependent on the government? Well, if you're not dependent on the government, guess who you're not voting for? Democrats. If you're independent, more likely you're going to vote for either the Libertarian Party or the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is the party of handouts. Big government. We're going to take care of you just like, if you want to put it in reparation terms, the slave master and overseer. And with that, I hope you get something out of this. Share this with somebody, anybody, everybody. Share it. Like, subscribe, that'd be cool too. Check out Mr. Video, support him and his journey. And peace. Have a good weekend. I'm out. I just wanted to remind you guys to check out thebrokecapitalist.com. You'll find some awesome books there, including a historical fantasy fiction series that I star in, called Ideas in Blood.